Okay, so this is my first uh, public speech going uh, public with this information, so bear with me. And um, <laughs> so it all started back in New Zealand, where I was um, in Wellington. Uh, there was a woman there. She had an affair with her sister's husband and accidentally got pregnant. And in the Pacific Island culture, uh, you, you know, that's very, very uh, taboo. And uh, the family would outcast you if you get found out. So what happened was she concealed the pregnancy for nine months and completely hid it from the family, even went to the hospital, gave birth, came back, and no one even knew that she had that baby, and that baby was me. So a French man, a Samoan uh, woman, came into the hospital, chose me, adopted me, from there, flew me from Wellington to Auckland, and they raised me as their own. I was the only child, and they didn't tell me I was adopted, because the mother, she was you know, dark-skinned, and so I thought, oh, yeah. I didn't, <laughs> so no, I didn't, didn't consider anything else. So um, one day I came home from school, I was 15 years old, and I came home, opened the door, walked in the lounge, sat down on the couch, went to watch the TV, my dad came straight in, clicked off the TV and said, Son, we need to talk to you. And I thought, oh no, he found out what happened at school today. <laughs> <laughs> and so I sat down and he said, look, your mother and I have um, decided to have a divorce and we're going to split up and she's going to move out of the house. And I thought, you know, 15 years old, what, what, is, what? what does that mean? You know, what are you, what are you saying? He said, she's moving overseas. She's found another man, she's, she's gone, she's out of here. Next week, she'll be gone. And by the way, also, you're not really our son and we're not really your parents. <laughs> and I, I, I was completely devastated. I mean, that was, that was the worst thing uh, in my life. That, that was the worst thing I've ever experienced. And so, you know, my whole world shattered. I, I, uh, every night I couldn't sleep, I couldn't eat. I was just in tears every day. And I was going to school in that condition and my friends noticed and one of my friends was like, you know what, you're always depressed. You need to smoke these drugs. And I thought, yeah, yeah give me that drugs, you know. <laughs> smoke the drugs. And I thought, oh man, where, where do you get more of this from? And then he said, oh, those guys over there. So I walked, met those guys and I, I was like, how come you guys have got lots of money and cars and stuff? And he said, oh, well, because we steal it. I thought, oh, how do you steal it? Oh, let me show you. So <laughs> come with me. So I learned all the tricks, everything from uh, how to run, how to hide from helicopters, police dogs, and um, they, they taught me everything. And my, this was my life. I'd go home from school. I'd uh, have dinner, go to bed, 9 o'clock. Uh, my dad would go to bed about 11. 12 o'clock, my friend would knock on the window. I'd open the window, jump out. And we would go and break into cars, and um, we used to, I, I used to open the cars, and he'd go in and pull the stereos out, and we'd be filling up the bags, car after car. And one day, we were, uh, he was in the car, and I saw a police car roll up with the lights off. And I thought, oh, they, they must have got a call from somewhere. And it was a canine unit with the dogs in the back, and I thought, oh, no. No, because this was the first time I'd ever um, had to deal with police dogs. And so I said, you need to get out of the car. No, and he's like, no, no, I want the stereo. I was like, no, get out of the car, the police are coming. And so we were arguing away, and then the, the police heard us, and then they got the dogs out of the car, and straight away started running, and we hit the alleyway, and we were running down the alleyway, and I saw the torch, you know, as, as the police were running, the torch was um, sh shining in front of us, and I thought, oh, we're not gonna make it, we need to jump the fence. So we jumped up on top of the fence, and the dog must have miscalculated the jump and hit the fence <laughs> and we fell off into the garden, ran to the next fence, jumped over, jumped to the next one and then I went out onto the street and hit the main road. It was two o'clock in the morning. Flew down the main road, fastest, fastest 100 metres ever. <laughs> and I went into another house, hid under a tree. I was trying to catch my breath and my friend was there and I just could see these two eyes coming in the, in the dark, like this straight torment. And I knew, I knew it was the dog, and I'd never done a backflip before, but 
I, I just jumped straight up, flipped straight over the fence. Uh, I ran straight to a, a hill where it was going down to the water. The police car was coming around. They were shining the torch out the window. Just managed to hit the grass and slide as the torch went past us. Went into the river, crossed the river to, to get rid of the scent so the dogs wouldn't chase us. Ran across the, the there was a golf course there. Then we hit the, the highway because the, uh, there was a big, um, big motorway there and the police cars were coming into the golf course so ran to the highway, crossed the highway, went to a park, found a set of train tracks and then ran and followed the tracks all the way back to my house. Five o'clock in the morning, climbed back in the window, went back to sleep, got up, went to school, <laughs> carried on, and that was every day. Every night was out doing that, so Dad knew nothing about it. But I was a rebel, because after that, after that experience, I realised that I don't know who these people are. Like they're, they're my, They said they were my parents, they're actually not my parents. So who are they? Who am I? Where did I come from? And so it separated me from them. And from that point, it just went downhill. And the crimes turned into, from cars, it went to houses, and I was doing a house a day, breaking into houses a day, uh, then two houses a day, three houses a day, then turned into shops, factories, scaling through supermarkets, um, and it just kept growing month in, month out, year in, year out, casinos, you name it. And we were just full-time, and I never got caught for any of it. Um, I just continued to go, and for five years, uh, I was in the underground dealing with uh, drug smuggling and weapon smuggling. Uh, we ended up shipping containers of weapons from Korea into Nigeria at the time. And I was uh, counterfeiting passports, credit cards, counterfeiting money, working with biker gangs, and I was living, living the lifestyle, you know. And um, until one day, I was drinking in the bar and told someone about it. They called the police. Interpol <laughs> came down, boom, took me out, threw me in jail. They, um, a lot of stuff happened in there and I was, I was uh, on remand because then you go to a court, they put you in jail first and then you wait for your court date, then they give you a hearing, then they sentence you then. So I was waiting <laughs> for that date and during, while you're in, in prison, you know, you don't get rehabilitated. What happens is you learn all the mistakes that other people made so that you don't make those mistakes. <laughs> so you end up actually learning more crime. So they told me how to get out of going to jail, um, how to get out from being sentenced, which I won't mention here. <laughs> and they, they said, you know, when you get up on the stand, make sure you don't ask for a duty solicitor, just, uh, just stay, um, say this certain thing, and then the judge will throw the case out. Sure enough, stand, said the thing, judge cancelled the case, put me on probation. So I was out. I tried to call my friends, and you know, they, were, they were basically, none of them were there for me. And in the criminal world, there's a code of, of conduct, which they all live by, and it's uh, basically, you don't leave your friends in the lurch, or whenever they're in trouble, you always back them up. You don't harm women or children, and you don't steal from poor people. And that's the general consensus. So all the prisons are split into two halves. One half of the prison is mainstream, the other half of the prison is those who have violated the criminal law. And that's how the prisons are set up these days, um, everywhere. So um, I, I came out of prison, went home to where I was living. All the friends were there, took my bag, clothes, jumped in a train, left. Left house, cars, everyone I knew, girlfriend, everyone. And I relocated to another place. And once I was separated from it, I realised that I was living off the grid because I didn't realise that, it, you know, when I went to go and, and re-engage in the education workplace, I didn't have any credit record, no history, no bank account, no certificates, nothing. I was completely locked out. And I was thinking, man, I need to figure out how to learn how to live in the grid now that I've been off the grid for so long. And so I went for, I knew that I had to get knowledge. So I started engaging different communities, groups, churches. I went into um, different places, like I went to a Catholic church. I learned a lot of stuff there. I went into a Christian church. I went into a, a Buddhist monastery, learned from there. I went into a Scientology church, 
they taught me some courses there. One of them was uh, called Personal Values and Integrity. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's, that's appropriate for, for, for what I need. <laughs> and um, I was like, do I need any pre-qualifications for that? <laughs> like, no, no, okay, fine. <laughs> so I took that course and halfway through the course they said, oh, you know, now you're at the stage where you've got to write down all the, all the crimes that you committed and transgressions because if you, if you get them out, you'll unburden and feel relief. I thought, oh, hmm, maybe, you know, I'll, I'll write it out, but I'm not going to give it to them, you know. So I thought, okay, I'll test it out, write it out, write it out. And it was like an onion. Once I started write, you know, getting stuff off, it felt better and better, and I got more and more off. And after two weeks, I'd written a full ream of paper <laughs> of about 900, cri uh, 900 crimes that the police never caught me for. And so the guy said to me, look, you need to, that's great, but actually you're a legal, you're a legal risk. <laughs> so you, you know, what you have to do is you're going to have to go to the police station and hand yourself in. It's not, you don't have to, but you know, it's the right thing. And I thought, man, this, these guys, oh, I can't believe it. And uh, I, I remembered, I used to um, watch a lot of Bruce Lee films when I was young, and you know, his theme was always, if you ever wanted to get rid of a fear, you had to face it. You know, I thought, man, yeah, this, that's right. So I went to the police station. I was expecting never to come back. So you know, once I hand them documents over. So I walked in there, gave them the documents, they looked at it, they thought, oh my God, this is, uh, there's a lot of stuff here. We're going to have to go through our records and there's a fair bit of paperwork to match everything up. So, <laughs> like, really? Oh, okay. All right then. So, um, I went away. He said, go away, come back. So, I went away. I came back a week later. I said, well, what happened? And he said, look, uh, we'd have to send all your stuff over to another station. That's where most of the crime happened. I thought, oh, wow, damn. And so I rang them and they said, look, we haven't received any files. And I was like, okay. Are you sure you sent it? No, 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 we've sent it. Here's the reference number, blah, blah, blah. Rang back, no, absolutely haven't seen it. I thought, oh, okay. Are you sure you've sent it? No, we've sent it, we've sent it. Look, there's no point in calling us. It all happened there. It's out of our hands, sorry. I thought, oh, my gosh, okay. So they said, please don't call me. <laughs> uh, okay. Went back to these guys, are you sure? Are you sure it's not here? They said, look, without any papers, what are we gonna process? We can't do anything, mate. There's no point in calling us. Please, just don't call me. <laughs> I stepped back and I thought, oh my God, I've failed again. <laughs> oh my God. And then I remembered, you know, what I learned in the, from the Buddhism side of it was, you know, there's karma and then there's this thing about, you know, and I thought, oh, wow, something good's happening. <sighs> It must, be, it must be karma. <laughs> so I told the guy at, at, the, at the course, and he said, wow, that's, that's awesome, that's amazing, but you know what you have to do is you have to, you can't just take from the community for five years and then get away with it again. You actually have to give back. So I rang the police, I arranged community service. They said, count your hours, pick a place. When you, when you feel like you've done enough, let us know. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> Are you sure? Okay. So I got into community work. They got trained in it, volunteered in it for 12 months. Drug rehab, worked in prisons, worked everywhere. Communities, schools. I was having a ball. You know, the kids, they couldn't lie to me because they were like, yeah, you're lying. You're lying. I know what drug you're on. You know. <laughs> and the kids were like, okay, you got me, you know. <laughs> so very easy to engage. And so after 12 months, I went back to the police station. And, um, I said, look, I've, I've, um, I've done almost 2,000 hours of community service here. Look, and he, he looked at that and he said, wow, man, that's, that's impressive. What do, you, what do you want from me? <laughs> and I said, um, well, you know, I can't get employed. I need something in writing that says that you won't press charges against any of the crimes I've committed. I know it's a tough ask, but, <laughs> you know, I need it. And because um, otherwise this, none of this really happened. And so he said to me, okay, and I just thought, oh, he's going to go, are you kidding? But he looked at me, looked at the document, then he decided, okay, got the letterhead, he said, what do you want me to say? And uh, he wrote, we the New Zealand police will not press charges against any of the crimes Andrew's committed based on the documents that he submitted on this date, signed it, stamped it, gave it to me, said, mate, well done. You made it. So, um, 
So this is the, exactly what he wrote. <laughs> so I kept the record of it, because you know, otherwise it never happened. And, um, and so since that day, I was, looking at the, I was looking at lifetime in prison, and now I had complete amnesty and a brand new life, and I contributed it to the fact that I was helping others. And so for that 12 months, it was the best feeling I ever had, helping other people. And I, I looked at that as a reward for that. And so I dedicated the rest of my life to helping others from that point on, and that was 16 years ago. And since that time, uh, this is actually me when I was just uh, got, out, got out of jail. <laughs> so I was a little bit skinnier because I used to run like the clappers, you know. <laughs> so since that time, I haven't been running, so. <laughs> um, so I work with the community here and um, a lot of ethnic communities, and I'm an advisor for them. I work with the Maori Wardens, and uh, I do strategic planning with them, uh, Africa Media, um, go into prisons, do mentoring with other youth, and um, I've, I work with the Islamic community. I'm also um, an event planner for them. That's my daughter. <laughs> She's, I raped her into volunteering. <laughs> and um, I do lectures on drug, drug abuse and that sort of thing. And so uh, this, is, this is how my life turned out. I've managed to, I'm a living, breathing example of you can change. You can change from the worst case scenario to the best case scenario. And I've done it and I can prove it. Thank you very much. <laughs>